Hello, my name is Andrew Gary and welcome to Seismic Sound Off In-Depth Conversations in Applied Geophysics. I am joined by Jonathan Aho Franklin, editor of the special section of the December 2017 issue of The Leading Edge on Geophysical Applications of Fiber Optic Distributed Sensing. Jonathan currently works as staff scientist in the Energy Geoscience Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and served as an associate editor for geophysics from 2011 to 2016. Jonathan joins me next. So for the uninitiated, could you briefly explain geophysical distributed acoustic sensing and distributed temperature sensing? So uh, distributed acoustic and distributed temperature sensing are are two pretty recently developed technologies. I guess DTS uh, was developed originally in the 80s and and DAS or distributed acoustic sensing was really developed. I mean, it's come come of its age probably in the last five years or so. Uh, So both technologies, they use kind of brief pulses of laser light to look at the scatter changes in scattering along the length of a single strand of fiber optic uh, fiber optic fiber. So, just to give you an idea, you know there are a bunch of intrinsic scattering modes which happen in fiber optics, and so when an environmental change happens around a fiber optic cable, you can actually detect that by changes in the scattering coefficients. So, mm-hmm. that could be for Rayleigh scattering. Maybe there's a little bit too much in the weeds. Uh, you know, is sensitive to changes in strain in the fiber, extensional strain, and Raman scattering is change, uh, sensitive to changes in temperature. So both of these technologies use these little brief pulses of laser light. You're looking at the changes in scattering, and from that you can infer uh, changes in strain, strain rate for, uh, for DAS or in temperature for, uh, for DTS. So then you go ahead and you take what's called a time for distance transform, and you, you, know, the, uh, you know the speed at which light travels in the fiber, so by looking at this whole train of scattering events which come back to you, you can infer, infer what's happening at every location on the fiber. So you're basically changing this one long continuous piece of fiber into, you can imagine, 10,000 geophones, except all of the measure uh, extensional strain rate. So it's really this local measurement of what's happening around the fiber, and it's very powerful because you're replacing a lot of point sensors with one continuous uh, sensor which you, where you can make measurements at every location along it. So often in situations where you're in the field, you have to m- always have to make choices with the number of sensors you can put out, and that has a lot of implications for your imaging algorithm and, and seismic acquisition. Here, you have sensors almost everywhere suddenly, and uh, that's very powerful. It allows you to stack, it allows you to do types of inversion analysis, which you really couldn't do otherwise. Is that a good summary? That is a, a wonderful summary. You, yeah. you mentioned strain a few times. Could you yeah. explain to me strain and its relation to DOS? Yeah, so, uh, so DAS is measuring uh, Rayleigh scattering, changes in Rayleigh scattering, and, that, and Rayleigh scattering changes as you start to stretch on a fiber. So it's sensitive to uh, extensional strain in the fiber itself and to other kinds of effects where you have a wave which travels through it, which maybe causes a strain, like you can have a P wave, which travels into a fiber and causes a, a stretch due to the Poisson effect. So um, that's changing the scattering from the laser or from that little pulse of laser light. And from that, you can infer how it's being, the fi- how the fiber is being stretched. So it's, it's actually really good. Straight fibers are really good at measuring surface waves and shear waves, a little bit less good at measuring P waves. But people are now going ahead and modifying the way these fiber optic cables are built to allow you to measure a local strain along every segment of the fiber. Um, and that's because you're measuring changes in Rayleigh scattering uh, as a function of time. I wanted to, to get into some specifics on the, on the papers. Sure. All of Santa Martina's list questions to consider for using DAS. For example, mm-hmm. what is the instrument response, noise performance, and repeatability? What do you see as the essential questions? Yeah. I mean, I think that those are good places to start. I mean, there's still a lot of unknowns with respect to instrument response. Uh, in theory, a lot of the different types of interrogators which are used for DAS should have response down to DC. But it looks like that there's a lot of, there's, there's fall off in the instrument response on the low end, which we're still trying to understand. And it could be due to packet, uh, package interactions and a host of other effects like coupling into the soil column. So, um, so while those are a good starting point, I, I would add in a couple of uh, other questions, which uh, we're continuing to work on. And that includes sensitivity to different wave modes. Um, and, you know, particularly the directionality of uh, cables which are used in DAS, their durability uh, in different kinds of deployment scenarios, and data handling. 
Um, so, I mean, you, you may not know this, but, uh, you know, when you're acquiring continuous data on tens of thousands of channels, suddenly this whole you know, data handling becomes a much bigger issue. And this has been dealt with in the marine community when, you know, when you're acquiring a uh, large 3D surveys, but a lot of people who are getting into DAS now just generally don't acquire data on quite this many channels at these rates. So, I mean, you have one interrogator can easily generate uh, tens of terabytes a week. So, and when you have multiple of these units which are in the field recording on long arrays, um, you quickly run into issues with filling up local RAID systems and dealing with data handling, which can only be remedied basically by mailing hard drives at this point. <laughs> so there are a lot of challenges re with respect to data flow, which I would add in addition to this, you know, basic questions about instrument response and noise performance. Um, the wave mode question is particularly interesting. There's been some theoretical work recently on that. But because, because you're measuring an extensional strain, you're more sensitive to waves which are traveling in one direction versus another. So for example, surface waves which are traveling in line with the fiber, you tend to be more sensitive to those stretches than P waves which are heading orthogonal to the fiber. So there's a lot of work which is being done now on how to engineer the fibers themselves to be more sensitive to waves traveling from different directions. I mean, if you think from a geophone perspective, you're just making a vertical, uh, you know, vertical velocity measurement at one point. And here, because you're measuring something which is like a difference between two horizontal phones, you're measuring the stretch, you have different types of sensitivity patterns than people are used to with geophones. On the low end in the special issue, in terms of frequency response, there was a, it's a really nice paper by Becker et al., which is exploring the very, very low, like 100, 120 second period response of uh, DAS cables to uh, pressure field variations. Um, and I think that's gonna be you know, increasingly an interesting topic. Um, people are starting to use DAS now for measuring uh, things which you know, geophysicists would usually say are quasi-static strains. So there's a, a you know, great paper, uh, which is in the special issue, looking at uh, behind casing uh, DAS to measure uh, slow strains associated with hydraulic fracturing. So I think that that's one space which it's really going to expand, is looking at these very low frequency to quasi-static effects using the same, uh, same technologies. You're kind of getting at it there. You know, how could this technology be utilized in something like unconventional reservoirs? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in unconventionals, there's the way which people have been using it to date, which is, you know, the, the place where this first got adopted is in the vertical seismic profiling community, because it's generally very hard to put dense arrays of geophones and wells for long periods of time. So the first place which DAS started being used in unconventionals is probably for, for VSPs. And then slowly it's been adopted for a micro earthquake recording as well. I mean, you know, you have these directionality issues you have to overcome. But the MEQ recording uh, on very, very long arrays is a, is a powerful tool. Um, because you have so many more sensor locations, it allows you to go ahead and do a better job with hypocenter locations and potentially looking at moment mechanisms as well, um, moment tensors. So, you know, sort of VSPs and MEQ was the first kind of application areas. But now, as, as you've seen, uh, so uh, it's a paper by Conoco Phillips, by uh, Bashali Roy and co-authors, it really allows you to see an example of looking at things like stress shadows uh, from an appropriate approaching fracture tip. So that's an example of using it to look at these things which are, are still dynamic, but are much closer to the DC strain limit. So you can really start looking at stress field perturbations, which are induced by each stage in a hydraulic fracturing operation. So I think that's a really exciting application. And, you know, when I, and I sort of tell people who work on geodynamics at the larger length scales about this, they get really excited too because there's not very many techniques which have the same sensitivity, because we're talking about nano strain, you know, range sensitivity, and yet you can do them inexpensively over very large length scales. Particularly for, um, for unconventionals, where as laterals get longer and longer, and we're talking about more and more stages, you need a monitoring technique which is uh, both inexpensive, but one which can scale with sufficient resolution to see each stage, but still you can instrument your entire well. And so that's a place which DAS really could, can shine. And there are, are several papers that sort of get at this return on investment in the technology. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I, I thought was interesting in the Mativa et al. paper, they pondered if the low cost acquisition using DAS would be good enough in a world accustomed to getting this quality 4D data and kind of moving progressively more into 4D. So what do you think about that? And, and how do you understand, you know, how could a manager understand the value of DAS or how could a geophysicist explain that to a manager? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's, uh, there's some domains where it's very easy to explain. So as, as I was referring to before, in the case of VSP, if you want to do 4D VSP on an offshore well, it barely needs explaining, to be honest. I mean, you know, with a relatively inexpensive operation at the beginning of a well's lifespan, where you're putting in a, a fi with this very, very small fiber bundle behind casing, you know, you basically can occupy and run for uh, 4D VSP in that well without having to take the well offline, potentially, you know, uh, without having to insert every, anything into the well bore, you know, to change, change the completion scenario. So, I mean, it's for 4D VSP, I think it's almost like a, it's almost like a give me, you know, as long as a 4D VSP itself is something which you need to understand the reservoir. And the cost associated with uh, using fiber for it is a lot lower than, you know, alternative, alternative scenarios like running in a locking three component array. I think as long as, you know, the geophysicist doing the processing can tolerate the slightly lower uh, signal to noise of a DAS acquisition, then there's a really strong return on investment argument for DAS. I think it's, it's kind of an evolving argument in the case of 4D surface acquisition where, you know, the, you know we're still at a point where and the fiber itself, you know, isn't as sensitive to normally incident reflected P waves. So that's a place where fiber design and new instrumentation is really coming into play. But I think eventually there will be a very strong return on investment uh, argument. I think something else to remember is that even if the single channel signal to noise for a little section of DAS isn't as good as for a single geophone, the fact that you have so many more channels means that, you know, when you go to the final migrated image, you could still have as good or even better signal noise just because of channel density, even if the individual channel signal noise is worse. So you really have to think in terms of what do you get out of the migrated image. Um, so like, let's say you had five locking geophones versus having a thousand DAS units, which you're migrating. I mean, you know, so it's, it's that the, the final image domain, which you have to think about. One challenge which DAS hasn't quite overcome yet is providing, you know, true uh, three component or four component data. And, you know, this is because, you know, you're, you're basically measuring an extensional strain in the fiber itself. And you have to think about how to design a cable which has appropriately wrapped fibers to be able to look at more than one component. So that's a really interesting area of active research. There's a bunch of stuff going on at Colorado School of Mines um, with Paul Sava's group looking at optimal designs for cables, which haven't been realized yet. I mean, this is all on the theory side, you know, to go ahead and allow you to record multi-component uh, on DAS. But as of right now, there's two general designs which people are using. One is just using a, a single straight fiber, which is making a measurement of extensional strain rate. And the other is coiling a fiber around a compliant inner core, like a, or basically a rubber core. And that allows you to do a better job of measuring uh, P waves, which are normally instant to the cable. Um, but it's still not a pure uh, vector measurement. And it's certainly not 3C or 4C at this point. So in situations where you need to do shear wave imaging and you need to know exactly which vector component you're measuring or if you need multiple components, that's something where DAS is still developing. You joined a, a number of authors to study the effectiveness of a, a novel fracking method in a, a shallow well using passive DAS. You know, what was the key question you all set out to answer and what did you find? Yeah, so that was a project led by Hunter Knox at Sandia and uh, the lead author was Stephanie James who led all the processing efforts. So in that particular project, uh, we were attempting to explore uh, using ex uh, a certain type of new explosives to generate more complex fracture patterns in hard rock. So the target is more on the geothermal side where for enhanced geothermal, you need to create a fracture network to uh, increase the thermal yield when you circulate water in a reservoir. So, you know, typically when you induce a fracture using traditional hydraulic fracturing techniques, your fracture orientation is determined by the, uh, the least horizontal stress. Um, so you end up getting a, a fracture which, which is orthogonal to the least principal stress. And often they're what are called bi-wing fractures and that they're relatively simple. Hopefully they'll hook into a natural fracture network, but they don't have a lot of complexity. So it makes it more difficult to, uh, to either sweep a, a larger volume of oil and gas in the unconventional business or to circulate enough water to get a good, uh, to sweep out the thermal energy in the case of geothermal. So the idea behind that effort was to look at these new explosives. Now, but the problem is, is you come up with some new explosive method to create a fracture network and you have to characterize it. And that's actually really complicated for explosive techniques. 
because, I mean, you can go and look, see what happens in the well bore, but in unconventionals, what you usually use is MEQ, um, micro-earthquakes, to help, help define the zone which is stimulated. With explosives, you can't do that because there's no sequential activation of small faults, which, you know, yields the energy you record with MEQ. There's one big blast, and you can record that, but it doesn't tell you much about the spatial distribution of fractures. So in that particular project, we were trying to come at the problem from a bunch of different techniques. This paper in the leading edge was focusing on using DAS and ambient noise, but we also had active seismic and ERT and a bunch of other techniques to characterize the fracture network. You know, ambient noise with DAS is like a really great combination because uh, with DAS, part of the, you know, the overall paradigm is that you suddenly have sensors almost everywhere and of, you know, intermediate quality. And the question is, what can you do with it? So you end up with this great asymmetry between uh, sources and sensors. You know, sources are generally, you have, don't have many of them. They're expensive to deploy. So ambient noise allows you to go ahead and use this noise, which is just reverberating through the environment, to go ahead and simulate, uh, you know, active source surveys. Um, for those who aren't familiar with ambient noise, ambient noise seismology, it was developed, I think, in the early, the early knots. And, you know, it involves doing cross-correlation between ambiently acquired, or, or data acquired without a source to synthesize these active source surveys. So if you have receivers everywhere, then suddenly there's a great, a great advantage to being able to do uh, processing like this to sort of simulate having sources everywhere. And then you can think about doing all kinds of things like tomography or reflection imaging. There's been a lot of work in the, uh, in the geophysical, geophysical community on ways of leveraging this. So in that particular project, the idea was to use ambient noise and DAS to go ahead and build a map of the fractured zones. And I mean, one of the challenges with ambient noise, though, which showed up at this project and in others, too, is that you're limited by the ambient noise, which is in your environment. So you, you're, whatever you, the processed result is limited by the bandwidth of this ambient noise. So you have to think about how you, you're going to do the stacking, the types of noise bands which you're going to be able to use, and what wave modes in the natural environment they correspond to. So uh, I think that project was, was uh, that side of the project was pretty successful. One of the challenges, though, was that um, there were pretty shallow wells where this test was done. And in DAS, you're often limited into, as, uh, with respect to the zone uh, or the length of the fiber you can use to acquire a high quality uh, single sensor kind of data. And that, that kind of zone which you're averaging strain rate over is called the gauge length. And so in that case, the gauge length was actually not that many more multiples of, uh, you know, it was uh, not that much shorter than the actual depth of the wells. So, you know, we didn't get a lot of channels because there were only 60 foot wells. So, um, so that was a little bit of a challenge to create like a really good tomographic image because it was a very small size site and DAS is, you know, you know, shines when you have longer length scales. Having said that, I, I think the result which Stephanie was able to put together was really convincing and quite neat. And we're in the process now of comparing it to the active source data, which we acquired using an array of small piezoelectric sources. Mm. So it'll be really neat to integrate those. Bakulin et al., their paper, I just, there was an excitement coming about the technology coming through on that paper. Yeah. And at one point they stated it's a paradigm change in land seismic. Yeah. What is this paradigm change that they are writing about? So I think the paradigm change is really this idea of having dense semi-permanent detectors almost everywhere. Because the cost of a fiber itself is so cheap, and you don't need that many interrogators to be able to record at dense channel spacing over very long distances, you know, it goes from this idea of having to, you know, go out and roll out these large arrays of geophones, either wired or wireless, to having a permanent array everywhere, um, which you can record at high data rates. So maybe it's a little bit lower uh, signal to noise than, than a traditional geophone. But I mean, when you start thinking about that, you know, there are a lot of things you can do. There's a premium to thinking about how you build uh, permanent sources. There's a premium for how you do noise reduction in these kinds of environments. And there's a premium for how you can use relatively short epic time-lapse data sets, right? Because if you've got these arrays everywhere, and let's say that you have an inexpensive source, and this was talked about in the Mativa paper as well, you know, what can you do with this higher resolution of 4D data? And I'm talking about resolution in terms of time as well as space. So in Bakulin et al. in particular, they were also looking at incorporating shallow wells as part of the acquisition process, which gives you information on statics and near surface velocity, which is really important in the context which they were writing about. But in general, I would say the paradigm shift is what do you do when you have dense detector arrays everywhere? What, you know, how, can, how does that change seismic acquisition? As someone involved in this field and this technology, what, what did you learn and what excited you about going through these papers and being involved in this section? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, there was, you know, so there was a combination of like new technology examples and uh, and sort of really good case studies where people were kind of trying to push the technology in different directions. So I really liked the Becker paper among, I mean, I liked all the papers, but the Becker paper I found particularly interesting because we're doing some work on, you know, detecting uh, earth, you know, like local and regional earthquakes using DAS. And in the Becker paper, they showed for the first time what the response function looked like at very low frequencies. You know, most of the seismologists who work in SEG, you know, you're thinking, you know, from half a hertz to 100 hertz. That's the kind of frequency band they live in. So there were not very many examples of looking on the very, you know, low end of the frequency spectrum. And he actually did a really nice job, you know, building a a little kind of signal to noise uh, plot for different low frequency measurements using a a nicely designed uh, little water tank, basically, which changed pressure and oscillated it at very low frequencies. So it sort of gave the first hint of that response function on the low end. And it's interesting that uh, response drops off as a function of frequency as you go towards DC, but not as quickly as a lot of people thought. Um, the other people, uh, other paper which I really uh, liked too was Bashali Roy's paper, this Conoco paper, which really sh- again showed this idea of doing dynamic strain measurements on, on DAS. Um, we've done, I mean, I've done some measurements, uh, strain measurements using fiber optics before using a uh, related technology called distributed strain sensing, which uses brilliant scattering. But I'd never really seen a great example of doing dynamic strain using a, a DAS unit. So that, I mean, it's just a very compelling paper. Um, it's also the cover, you know, if in case you looked at the actual actual physical paper cover. But I mean, you know, once you can look at things like stress shadows and changes in stress state during unconventional production and stimulation, you start you can start thinking about how do you optimize the stages which you run in unconventional wells based on the stress state and how you perturb it. So it really kind of, um, you know, suggests that there's a lot of opportunities with using uh, stress state monitoring using DAS to kind of, you know, carefully design and optimize the way which you change permeability in the subsurface. So having strain everywhere too was, you know, kind of a really neat thing. So I think that both the Wu paper and the Becker paper, which are exploring the low end of DAS response were ones which I particularly excited me. Would you recommend, you know, maybe there's a, a, a geophysicist listening to this or seeing this technology that maybe their first thought isn't this is applicable to my work and my job. You know, do you think there's someone, uh, you know, a particular branch of geophysics that would find this interesting that maybe at first flush wouldn't draw the connection between their work? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, I think the problem is more the opposite. You know, there, there are not very many sort of zones where it's not applicable. And that's the exciting part about it. You know, when I give talks on DAS at very academic places and very applied places, everybody's, you know, excited by the technology and the opportunities. You know, so I think that everybody from earthquake seismologists all the way up to people working on ultrasonics and sonar, you know, can find, you know, a niche, you know, which they can apply uh, DAS and these other types of distributed sensing modalities. I, you know, it's hard, yeah, it's harder to find places where it's not applicable. What do you hope readers of the special section take away? I hope they take away the, you know, the wide range of applications which DAS and, you know, we have one DTS paper can be applied to in geophysics. And, you know, I hope they kind of appreciate that uh, it's, it's a technology which is getting closer and closer to the way they traditionally acquire data. That it's something which, you know, because of its, you know, the current and improving price point, it's very competitive, if not exceeding, you know, uh, traditional geophone acquisition in a lot of different contexts. You know, I hope they see that it can be applied not only to seismic, but to much lower frequency measurements as well, you know, looking at things like dynamic strain. And it can be applied for both cases where you, you have sources, you know, like traditional vibra size studies and to situations where you're just looking at environmental noise, like, uh, like ambient noise seismology. And I hope they appreciate that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great field to get involved with, with a lot of opportunities. And, and just one more question for you. What, what are you most excited about in this field to discover or to see the possibilities of it existing out there? Yeah, so the, the part of the, fe- you know, the future which I'm involved with, and there was one paper which discusses this in the special issue, is the idea of using a kind of uh, existing telecom fiber optic networks to record seismic data. So as you may know, I mean, te- you know, fiber is pervasive in our natural environment. There's a lot of it which has been installed over the years for fiber optic communication. And, uh, you know, 
we're really interested in going ahead and using that as kind of a massive seismic sensing array. Uh, myself, more for near surface uh, ambient noise studies, and then also for uh, for uh, uh, seism traditional seismology applications. But you can think about a lot of different applications you can use that network for. And the most expensive part of installing fiber networks on the surface is the actual trenching or drilling process to get the fiber in the ground in the first place. And so with telecom fiber, it's already been done for you. All those permits have already been made. And there are many, many kilometers, tens of thousands of kilometers in the United States, which are installed already. So we're working hard on that. There's a paper uh, by Aline Martin and Biondo Biondi in the special issue, which explores that kind of recording on the telecommunications network, which is at Stanford University. And we're looking at it um, on the much larger scale on a section across the Sacramento Basin to do things like groundwater monitoring and also detect local and teleseismic earthquakes. So that's actually something I'm really excited about is using the sensors which are everywhere, which don't e you don't even have to pay to install them. You just have to find the place where you can hook into the network and get permission. Um, and suddenly you've got these 10,000 channel arrays. Any, any other final thoughts to, to share with our listeners or the readers? You know, one thing about DAS too, which, you know, I wanted to mention is that the ideas behind it are actually not that new. They're from the 80s and the, a lot of Navy patents in the 80s uh, for listening for submarines using these types of methods. But really, because of the advances in the interrogators and the photonics, the laser sources and detectors, uh, in the way which the special purpose cables are designed and the processing, you know, it's really only very recently that this has become a way which we can do things, like maybe the last five years. So for, you know, for listeners who are excited about it, this is their chance to get in early and, you know, and learn about the technique as it's still expanding. So, you know, even though we've got this history, it's really a pretty young field. So, you know, it's your chances now. At seg.org slash podcast, you will find the show notes and links to the December TLE. Subscribers can read the full articles in the SEG digital library. And for those currently not subscribed, abstracts for each of the Leading Edge papers are always free. To learn more about becoming a member or subscribing to the Leading Edge, visit seg.org slash membership. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Your review helps others find the show. Subscribe to Seismic Sound Off on the podcast app of your choice to receive the latest episodes first. Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki, home to hundreds of biographies of key geoscientists, geophysical tutorials, and core content from the science of applied geophysics. Visit wiki.seg.org to learn how you can grow the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. This episode was produced by Isaac Farley and hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off. Seismic Sound Off.